I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but I just wanted to let you know a little bit about uh, what Modita is and, and uh, how it operates. So Modita is uh, an acronym for the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics. Well, the A used to be Atomic Physics. It's an old institute. It started in the late 50s in Copenhagen. That's when Atomic Physics was the, the all and end all of theoretical physics, of course, but uh, since then, uh, it has, during its history, 50-year history in Copenhagen, it uh, diversified beyond atomic physics to basically any branch of theoretical physics that people found interesting at the time. Um, it is a small institute by most standards. Um, and slightly smaller here than it used to be in Copenhagen. It has a, a faculty of about 10, 10 and uh, half of those we aim uh, for in the long run will be uh, junior faculty, assistant professors who have five-year fixed-term positions. And then uh, the long-term plans call for having actually only three senior professors and then uh, the directorship is something which is a temporary position but is usually occupied by a senior professor. Also. So we have faculty of 10, we have another 10 or so postdoctoral fellows, and then depending on how well we do in, in, in getting grants and such things, the number, we have some PhD students at the moment, we have five PhD students uh, working with, uh, well, most of them working with Axel. But um, as I said, it's, a, it's an old institute. It was in Copenhagen for 50 years, then through some political changes in the uh, Nordic cooperation. Now, this is a Nordic institute. It's run by the five Nordic countries. And uh, it used to be in Copenhagen. It was actually directly owned by what's called the Nordic Council of Ministers. And then after these changes, uh, it was moved to Stockholm, where it's now owned actually by the two local universities, Stockholm University and uh, the Royal Institute of Technology. But beyond that, it, it actually has remained very much a Nordic institute. It has a Nordic governing board with representatives from all the Nordic countries. And uh, the, of course, our primary focus is on the science, but then sort of the secondary focus is, is very much Nordic. To promote Nordic collaboration, to promote collaboration between the Nordic countries and world in our, in our subject. Now the way uh, we operate, it, it's clearly clear of course that with such a small scientific staff we're not going to be covering all of uh, theoretical physics, but uh, it's precisely activities like these programs, like the one that you're uh, participating in, which we try to make up for some of that. Now these are about, we put about a quarter of our resources into, into the programs, we run them usually for a month or a month and a half seems to be a good length. And there we bring in groups of 20, 25 people who are interested in a particular area. It can be quite specific problems or it can be a more general area. And again, our Nordic focus comes in in that it's, uh, we usually have a mix of Nordic participants and international participants. We also like to have a mix of senior participants and more junior people. And uh, these programs, because they are short in duration, we can do a number of them each year. And uh, we are open to a rather wide scope of, of activities. It's not just theoretical physics. It's basically any theoretical natural science where people can propose programs in. We have uh, an external board or an external committee that evaluates and ranks the proposals and then makes recommendations to our governing board, our Nordic governing board. And this way, I think we can provide a service to a much larger scientific community than we could just through our in-house uh, research, where we tend to focus on core subjects in, in, in theoretical physics. So at the moment, of course, we have a strong emphasis on, on astrophysics through uh, access program astrophysics, we have just hired a professor of high energy physics. He will be arriving in uh, September, Constantine Zarembo, in the Colomar in, in Paris. And uh, we have advertised for a, the third and final uh, senior professor. He will be hired next year. We have a deadline in 
in September for an application in, uh, in theoretical condensed matter physics, rather broadly defined. Now, I don't think I will take up more of your time. If you have any quick question, I'm of course happy to answer either now or, or at some other time if you plan to. But I hope, wish you have a, a pleasant and uh, successful collaboration here for the, for the next few weeks. Thank you, Laura, first of all. If you have any questions, So back in Copenhagen, this institute was all been funded fully by the this Nordic Council of Ministers. Now, part of course the political motivation for that led to the move in the, was that they wanted to go out of the business of owning institutes, but they're still funding us and the other Nordic institutes at about 50 to 60 percent of our total funding. Then we get matching funds. We had rather generous startup funds for the first three years here, but now we have matching funds that come from the universities. They're in the form of the facilities, or so the buildings are covered by the universities. Uh, we are exempt from overhead charges, mm -hmm. which is quite important when we have grants coming in. And of course, we're also exempt from overhead on the grant from the Council of Ministers. And then finally, they also pitch in operating funds uh, to, so this, when you count all of this, it is roughly matching funding. And then we have to make up sort of the last quarter of our financial needs, the direct operating funds we have applied to the infrastructure committee of the Swedish Research Council. And we did get funding there, uh, 2.7 million Swedish dollars per year now for two years. But there are some issues there. We, we're, it's not clear. Well, what is clear is that that particular part of the SIS Research Council is not going to fund us in the future. So we're currently negotiating, but the game plan is that we will get half our operating funding from uh, the Council of Ministers, one quarter from the universities, and then one quarter from the Swedish Research Council, and of course through project grants. All our faculty are involved in, 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 in project grants. Including European projects? Or? Absolutely. We have, well, Axel has an ongoing ERC project, which uh, is, is quite a substantial addition both to our staff and to our operation in general. I think you probably said this, uh, oh, oh, and your budget? budget or? No, I didn't say it. But, uh, again, if you count everything with, with the overhead that we get charged and then gets repaid, and the, uh, the, old, the gross annual budget is about 33, 34. Million Swedish kroner last year, which is about mm. three, little over three uh, million euros. So it's not a huge operation. Yeah. Still, it does take some effort to get it, to raise the funds, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, a large part of my work here, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, when can you send in proposals for borders? Uh, uh, every year in December is the deadline. So last December we took proposals for programs to be run in the second half of 2011 and the first half of 2012. Okay. So next December will be the year for the year after. Okay. And if you have, if you're interested in submitting proposals, then absolutely uh, get in touch if you if you need information or, or if you want some assistance with assistance with that. We are going to develop more precise guidelines for proposals uh, during the year now. This committee that does our evaluations now, they, 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 were put, they came together for the first time this past year, and they have concrete proposals for, for how things should be done and how, that, how the information flow to the uh, prospective applicants could be better, and so we're going to work on that over the summer. So that will be in place before the next round. So then you can check out our homepage or Another thing, which is these uh, studentship things, maybe you can yeah, say so a few about this, so because this the deadline is coming up fairly soon. Right, and this is, this is specific though to the Nordic and Baltic countries, but uh, 
but we are uh, offering uh, visiting uh, scholarships for stays of uh, basically we're thinking for about two three months for PhD students who can come here and either participate in a program or just participate in, in the general scientific work here. Either they can come to specifically work with one of our faculty or they also possibly if they want to work with people here at the local universities, that's we're also do that also. And these are, uh, it's a new program, we haven't, we're just starting it out, so it's not out small, but if it's successful, then we will enlarge that. And the, the first deadline is at the end of May uh, this year, the space for the fall. And then again in November will be a deadline. That's our plan is to have basically, it, it should be, a, it's a simple application, just a recommendation letter from the advisor and, and uh, just a brief description of what the student wants to do. But this, we're thinking this might be particularly useful for PhD students who are at the smaller universities. So there's plenty of small universities, of course, in the United countries. Or perhaps the they could benefit from being in a larger uh, research environment, or maybe even take some advanced courses that are offered here and are not offered. Mm -hmm. But again, the, this, this is a new program, so it can go in different ways. And these positions should be from the Nordic countries? Or? They should be working at Nordic or Baltic universities. They can be from anywhere. If it's successful, we may extend it beyond that. <coughs> this is sort of a pilot program that we're starting. So that's for a duration of three to four months, yeah? Of the main. That's what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not going to be a huge number of students either. We're starting small. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to the deadline for the full professorship that you mentioned, which I think was the 15th of September now, yeah. we have a deadline for postdocs, and that is typically around the 15th of November mm -hmm. each year. That's also something which is, that has been opened up. It used to be in the old days, they had to be Nordic citizens even. But now we're open to application from anywhere. This past year, we evaluated 350 applications, I believe. And uh, we had six positions. <laughs> but we had, uh, we get good help there. We have these committees. We have research committees in three different areas, which are Nordic scientists that uh, help us out with this. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Lars, for your help. Okay, so I think now we come to the more practical matters, and I think um, Niels has can uh, make a few statements about some... Um, yeah, not too much. Some much. Issues. It was, yes, uh, I spoke in um, I think all of you who are traveling here have got an email from Hans with this as an attachment. attachment. So please just fill it out with your receipts and stuff and, and hand it in and it should be, uh, the money should be transferred to your account. We don't need all these SWIFT numbers and EBAN numbers and okay. these things. But if there are any problems, I think yeah, Hans or Anne I want to, to talk to. Also, I guess all of you have found your, your, your offices. If you don't have these for us, please just have one here. Uh, I hope all of you have found your offices and there are internet connections there. And I think if you need wireless, you talk to Hans. We'll give you a note with some, some password and stuff on it. And also when you want to print something, there are two printers in the house, I think. And also there you need to talk to Hans in order to set it up. You know, Hans is the last office before they, they go out. Uh, for, for Mac, it's supposed to be pretty easy. For, for Windows, you need to, to install some drivers for these printers. Uh, with anything else? Uh, And if, if any, any other problems appear, I guess uh, Anne is the one to talk to? Yes. With the apartments or anything? It's uh, regarding apartments, it's Hans. Oh, it's Hans even that, okay. Regarding apartments, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So any questions, please just call now. Any questions of practical matter that Niels can maybe answer? Uh, yeah, is there anything from your side that you want to, that comes to mind regarding organization? Okay. So, question? Uh, yes, I just want to talk to you about the form. Yeah. That is the special form that we should be working on. Ah, here. So, the plan is that we have a uh, few talks each week, typically uh, between one and two talks each week. Sometimes it can be more. In addition to that, however, we do have uh, a number of discussion sessions that will be filled by several people typically. Uh, and so the first discussion session will be tomorrow morning at 10.30, and that will be about uh, um, NES modeling of combustion. Uh, given that this is a very important subject, of course, we are likely to return to that, so that's not the only uh, occasion when that will be discussed, but it will be the first one at least. And uh, further details which discussions should take place and when, uh, we have left open for now, so we can make decisions about this uh, either today or in the following days and weeks. Uh, before coming to that, and I think we should be coming to that before uh, 3 o'clock, uh, that's when uh, Michael Lieberman is giving his talk, uh, I was thinking we should introduce ourselves uh, with some brief statement about what we are working on and what we anticipate in getting out of this program during this time. Uh, given that I'm s standing up here, I can say about a few words myself. I think it's probably useful if uh, people uh, write down their name again, <coughs> even though you may find it, but it's uh, often easy, difficult to hear. And so my name is Axel Brandenburg. As Laros was already saying, I'm, uh, my main work uh, research field is really astrophysics. It's astrophysical fluid dynamics that includes uh, turbulence calculations, simulations on the computer in uh, 3D, three-dimensional domains, which are mostly in Cartesian domains. In some cases, we have been working towards calculations in spherical wedges also. So. 3D simulations. In addition to um, solving the fluid equations, we are also often including magnetic fields. And we are interested in the process by which magnetic fields are being generated. In that connection, I can immediately say something where combustion effects could perhaps be of some importance. One of the things we have found in modeling MHD turbulence is that in addition to the kinetic energy spectrum, which looks like this in wave number space, there can be a magnetic field, a, bit, a weak magnetic field to start with, but it then begins to grow until it reaches saturation. And it, be, and it has the strongest power at small scale, so it increases with like k to the plus three halves. And given that it is peak at small scales, it matters exactly uh, what is the nature of the velocity field where the magnetic field reaches its peak. Here it's in the inertial range, whereas if the magnetic frontal number which determines the cutoff, if it's uh, this large uh, frontal number, this cutoff would be if much further to the right. It would be in the diffusive range. In the diffusive range, as we heard, those of you who were at the talk by by uh, Srinivasan, they heard that the velocity properties are very different in the diffusive <coughs> range than in, in the inertial range. And so what has been found is that the onset of dynamo action is very much delayed as we go from here to here. The critical value of the diffusivity needed to reach dynamo action becomes approximately 10 times bigger as you go from here to here. Now, in between, however, this is not exactly as innocent as it looks like from here, because if you plot this in a compensated way, the compensated power spectrum 
looks not exactly flat and goes down, but it should go piles up a little bit. And that's called the bottleneck effect in turbulence. And it's not normally taken uh, that seriously in, or not, uh, it, it's not uh, so emphasized in normal uh, plots of atmospheric turbulence, but the reason for this is really that one is looking at a one-dimensional spectrum, and there's a difference between a one-dimensional spectrum and a three-dimensional spectrum. Because they are related only through an integral transform, and those are equivalent when you have power law scaling, but not when you are deviating from power law scaling as yet. And so the onset of dynamo action becomes uh, even worse than a factor of 10 uh, if you are in this bottleneck effect region. So that's one of the uh, things one has to be aware of if one does direct numerical simulations at not the asymptotic regime of very large Reynolds numbers, but if one has Reynolds numbers on the order of, his, of only a thousand, so to speak. Of course, it's much bigger than a few hundreds already, but it's uh, not 10 to the 6. Uh, I'm also interested in uh, working on uh, simulations of, of real turbulence, and that's uh, work done together with Niels Haugen and uh, Natalia Babkovskaya, and she will be coming on the 5th of this month. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also working on uh, simulating passive scalars, and uh, in particular at the moment we are working on the Fisher equation in connection with three-dimensional turbulent flows. So that's, these are the few words about my introduction. And then we can go down uh, the list. Either we go down to you. <laughs> so please come forward and uh, write your name and use a whiteboard for a short <coughs> self-presentation. Uh, you mean uh, a little short presentation? No, no, just, uh, no, just go through the rows, and before it's three comes, so don't give too much time. What we are doing now, it is a large program uh, with the goal of understanding uh, turbulent combustion, and particularly uh, transition from deflagration to detonation regime. Uh, what we use is uh, direct numerical simulation. Uh, based on the uh, coarse particle method. And uh, at the moment we are restricted to two-dimensional problems, not because of we cannot do three-dimensional, but just because of we, are, uh, we want to be sure that uh, simulation are really done with very high accuracy, with uh, very high resolution, space resolution and time resolution. So uh, this means, for example, that um, we can make simulations, we use a large uh, parallel machine in uh, Moscow. It is uh, it's called, uh, I don't know how it's called. It. Where is it? <laughs> but it is, in what place is it? It is a uh, machine at Moscow University. It is a new machine which uh, have been, it has been installed recently with <coughs> something uh, 886 uh, uh, core processors. Uh, so this machine allows us to make simulation of taking, say, up to 10 to 9 cells uh, green cells. <coughs> uh, resolution which we use something up to uh, hundreds uh, cells per width of the flame in some cases to be sure that it is really very high resolution. Uh, it's not necessary in fact such high resolution. Just to, uh, to check and to verify convergence of the solution and this. So the result which we received regarding uh, simulation of uh, transition from deflagration to detonation happened to be in extremely good agreement with experiment. We described experimental uh, study of transition to detonation from which has been done 
uh, in uh, capillary tubes from 1.5 mm up to 10 mm and in a big uh, shock tubes uh, with diameter 5 cm and 6 m long. So this is uh, part of the program which we are running now and he involved both uh, theorists uh, people who are doing <laughs> simulations and experimental people. Experiments done, <coughs> experiments on um, transition from deflagration to detonation done in Karlsruhe uh, Nuclear Center and in Kurchatov Institute. Okay, you will tell us, of course, all the details about this, so then we will postpone questions until then. Uh, that reminds me of the detonations that we have underground. Uh, this is part of a big uh, operation underneath, in some cases really only uh, some few 10 to 20 meters underneath us, where they are building a network of roads that are supposed to alleviate the overland traffic in by 10, 2015. So that work is pretty much uh, done now, I think, but of course not completely, and that's why you still have here these explosions. They're about three times a day. Perhaps. It's not explosions, of course. Uh, dynamite, and of course, all very well organized. Several years ago, I had my own experience with the donation when I had to build a garage at home. Oh. and. It was, it was necessary to explode a large, uh, piece of, uh, of rash, a large rock. Thank it you. was fantastic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Andrea, please come forward and write down your name and yeah. say what you're doing and interested in. Yes, thanks. <coughs> so, my name is Andrea. Um, I am originally from Italy, but I live in Norway, Brunei. Uh, I work for a, a contract research company called uh, Sintep. A few of my colleagues uh, are here or will come later in the program. Uh, so we work with mostly applied pro uh, problems that industry has, but uh, uh, we also apply uh, today some fundamental knowledge or we do research in fundamental direction to solve this problem. Uh, my background is from uh, uh, originally from gas dynamics uh, at uh, master level, then uh, turbulent combustion uh, in my PhD. Um, that uh, is what I still do, actually. Um, I have worked uh, uh, some years with uh, also multi-phase uh, flow problem. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I thought this was very difficult, so I left it. <laughs> 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 so I stay here, which is not easy, but uh, still I think it's <laughs> easier than uh, multi-phase. Uh, no problem. And uh, I have mostly worked with uh, DNS and uh, RANS methods. Um, those, I believe, have a solid uh, theoretical uh, fundament. I have not uh, uh, used uh, LES methods uh, so much. I know uh, the assumption of this method, but I have not uh, used them in uh, practice. Um, so, and uh, I was here also for the last week of the turbine boundary layer program because uh, most of my, well, a good part <coughs> of my work in this is related to flame propagation in boundary layers. So, it's uh, a topic which is uh, important for some industrial application, and this is why. Uh, I've been focusing on this. I guess this is everything. And, uh, yeah, we will meet.
later on, I guess. Excellent, thank you. Yes, please. So I, I think I'll leave some of this stuff. Yes, please. But I have to change the name, though. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Nils Alan Haugen. I'm also from, from Trondheim. Uh, I'm working at Sintef, the same group as uh, Andrea. Um, I also currently, what I'd like to say is some of my background, I'd like to make it a person. I, I did my PhD here at Nodita with, uh, with Axel. We were working on these issues uh, of, uh, of isotropic turbulence with the bottleneck. These things, both with DNS and also with, with LAS. And we work somewhat on MHD as well. Um, then I work, moved to, to Sintef to the work of the combustion group. And there we are working now on, uh, together with, with Axel and Natalia, with uh, implementing um, uh, a chemistry module into the our our code, which is now known as the pencil code, which is open source DNS code. Yeah, <laughs> like the Axel shirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this work we are kind of finalizing now, and now we hopefully will start to use these these modules during this program, and we really need to get started on that. Uh, I also we used uh, a little bit uh, of runs in the last years, but mostly what I'm doing the, the days here is on, on multi-phase, and then it's on slightly downstream from the combustion zone itself. We were looking at, at particle tracking or large particles, and, and, and the, the, the reason for this is that you have typically in uh, in boilers you have all these tubes with the water go through, and you want to heat this water. And the ash particles comes towards these these tubes and they tend to deposit, and creating an insulating layer here, which we really do not want. So we use DNS and and uh, Russian particle tracking to try to understand how these um, particle deposition occurs. Tubes uh, are cold or cold, yeah. So basically, you have the, the cold water coming in. I mean, relatively cold. And hot fluid gas coming up here, heating the cold water to, to first the economizer in, in, uh, in the operator and superheater into, into high pressure steam, which is run to a steam tube turbine. And particles, is it boiling particles or is it computer? Sorry? What kind of particles? Oh, it's basically ash particles uh -huh. from the combustion itself. Mm -hmm. And then the real problem comes when these particles contain uh, these earth alkali metals and chloride and, and this stuff because the earth alkali metals tend to be kind of sticky at the temperatures of the fluid gas for, if this is very hot here, uh, you have temperature here around 600, 700 uh, degrees. These particles become sticky and when they hit the surface they stick. What is that for this one? They range from, from sub-micrometers, which are not so, so dangerous because the Stokes numbers are small, they just follow the, the, around the tube, up to maybe 200 microns. And what we see in many of these where we burn uh, bio, some kind of biofuel, uh, that for particles around, around 50 microns tend to, to uh, um, contain a lot of chlorine. So when they, they stick to the surface, they corrode it as well. So it's really expensive and dangerous stuff. You really want to understand this stuff. Right, that's like the downstream from the, the combustion. And then we have also worked uh, a little bit on, on, uh, on uh, acoustics. With the uh, thermoacoustic oscillations. Which is a well-known problem. And we have written a, a, a one-dimensional um, Nonlinear code for doing that. Right, that's it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, no connection with volcanic ash, that's a different story. <laughs> that's a different story, yes. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. At least the scales are very different. Yeah, we start with spin R, go down spin R, next one. So, uh, well, it's has been only six months I'm working in Korea. Um, the aim of my uh, PhD is to simulate uh, the flame wall interactions in uh, motors. I mean, in when you are injecting uh, fuels in the motor, you need to simulate the flame wall interactions. Co so, combustion engine. Yes, yes, sorry. Engine. Yeah. My English is not very perfect. So. Uh, I'm working with uh, the IFP, it's French uh, Institute for Petroleum. Um, and I'm using the Asphodel code. Uh, which is a very good DNS uh, code, but um, for now, we can only use one processor, so it's not for the life. Um, I'm working with uh, Julien Reveillon uh, to use MPI to make it uh, parallel. So I'm here in Novita to work, of course, on parallel, parallel levitation. Uh, and I am having some problems with this question, the questions because we are using a low Mac approximation. Uh, um, I'm here also to work on physics because uh, we are dealing with chemical problems because uh, due to high uh, temperature gradients in the other world, sometimes uh, a simple chemistry is not uh, efficient. Um, well, I'm asking a lot of questions about it, so I'm here to understand and to ask uh, things about it. This code, is it, is it open? No, it's <laughs> not yet. Yeah, not, not yet. yet. Uh, and it, it, but it is only one processor. You do only in the simplified uh, chemistry? Or can you do it? No, no, you can. Well, it's very, very uh, huge code. You can do uh, particle tracking, you can do DNS, uh, LES. <coughs> uh, it is a uh, low max number of codes, but you can also use compressible. <coughs> uh, but on the other hand, uh, nobody used to, to use MPI for this code, mm -hmm. so it's only score. But the discretization is it, uh, based on the final differences? Or is it well, well um, for now you have um, MD4, so tiny, uh, uh, tiny difference, I know. and you have Paddy scheme. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. We are using uh, Runyukuta for, for time frame. I think it's very, very efficient one, but uh, well, we need to to run it on multiple processors. So I'm working on it. It's a but very it doesn't use compact fields. Yes, it yes. does. Well, yeah. that's the problem. Oh, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For parallelization. Yeah. Doesn't have It's not necessarily so much better than uh, as it was explicitly explicit high order scheme. Of course, we also don't use compact schemes anymore because it's difficult to parallelize them, mm. and um, yes, because it would require global transposers. Mm. Uh, <laughs> briefly, it is uh, it is and, and the running NPI that was actually how it was built back then, but uh, doing solving the Poisson equation is difficult for us as well. We have to do it by a Fourier transform at the moment, and mm. and that requires global transposers. So for now we are using Fishback. So, so you know, it's a very efficient uh, uh, Poisson solver um, because it is not uh, possible to use it in parallel. Uh, I'm coding a big section, stable, you know, big, uh, something like PCG, frequency of uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, but, well, more uh, good one. 
I'm walking in the corner. This is not a multi-grid solder, is it? Is it a multi-grid solder? This pit? Uh, yes. It is We're a multi-grid. Well, um, huh? in fact, the VCG is not uh, frequent tuner. Yeah. But we are using a uh, multi-grid, so with a black box. You know? Then I'm Eric Albert, and I am also working in Korea, in Rouen, normally. Uh, but uh, on a different subject, uh, I study the interaction uh, of flame with turbulence, most particularly in, a, in a expanding flames, like a spherical wall or cylindrical wall. Uh, we use uh, two uh, different approaches. One approach is to suppose the, uh, the, the flame as an infinite um, interface, yeah, which uh, considerably reduces cost. And uh, also with DNS, with compressible uh, acoustic uh, treatment of boundaries, etc. And we compare both approaches with uh, experiments too. But, uh, um, I have just defended my PhD on, on this subject uh, last week. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, but we were confronted to a big problem, is how the, the flame interacts with the, the turbulence, because when the flame grows, uh, it will uh, def uh, deform, I don't know, st uh, stretch the, the turbulence. And this is uh, not well reproduced with uh, the the, the approach who, who, who don't, who, uh, which does not solve what's happening uh, inside uh, the turbulence here. That's why we, we would like to study more uh, this kind of, of flame, this kind of flame, but this we don't have uh, experiments and uh, we can uh, simulate it uh, with uh, different approaches. That's what I would like to, uh, to do here. Yes. and. Uh, uh, maybe uh, I will find some people to discuss about it. What kind of numerical experiment? It's in only numerical, yeah. yeah. But uh, we have some uh, experimenters uh, in the lab tree and uh, they did uh, this kind. This kind? Why? Because uh, when you ignite by a spark, yes, you get uh, a spherical one. But spherical uh, is difficult to, uh, to study numerically. It's easier uh, cylindrical, but to learn is too easy. Are you using the same code as... Uh, no, no, it's a uh, Allegro, it's a compressible solver. And uh, we, uh, we use uh, a finite difference, but uh, not a compact one. And uh, with staggered grids, mm -hmm. it allows to, uh, to use less points to solve the same physics, in fact. Yeah. Mm. Then, uh, yeah, most of my uh, job is also uh, numerics uh, to work uh, on schemes, uh, develop schemes. Uh, what is the actual? Is it a large edge simulation or direct numerical? It's a direct numerical simulation. And what Reynolds number you shift? Uh, depends how you define it, but uh, we, uh, we reach uh, over this one based on. And you can uh, explain. You know, I'm sorry. Reynolds, yeah, no, no, Reynolds. It's uh, uh, SL, laminar time scale, by uh, the integral scale. L is a scale, a gigantic scale of the world. Integral. Integral scale. Uh, we are, the, the biggest uh, simulation is uh, something like 3 centimeters, 3 centimeters, like this, and uh, during 7 uh, milliseconds with acoustic, uh, with, yeah, uh, solving the acoustic. Voilà. Okay. Uh, and the reason you wanted this spherical thing was because that was the experiment. Yes, there, right? yeah. But, but, the, and, but that's the experiment is done within an enclosure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the experiment. Uh, yeah, there is two kinds. Uh, you can inject uh, uh, 
some pure, uh, some premix pure, uh, a premix tube here, mm -hmm. and uh, with a tubular series, and after you ignite uh, with two, uh, two right, uh, sparks, and uh, you follow uh, the growth like that, but uh, you, mm -hmm. you can do as it, if it was like this, yeah, of course, and uh, the other one is uh, like, uh, uh, there is a behind, yeah, I don't know, uh, something, to, you can push, compress the gas inside, it's and with the tubular screen, and yeah. this uh, is, uh, you have a lot of tubulars, but you, uh, you wait uh, until you have the, the, uh, the tubulars you want, and after you ignite it here, since the, the flame is far from the, from the walls, that's why there is no more interaction, uh, not a lot of interaction between the wall because of the velocity profile, yeah? Uh, L against R, then uh, you, you can consider there is no work. Yeah? As long as you, you're quicker than acoustics, right? I mean, uh, you know, the... No, I, I, uh, I studied acoustic because I had an acoustic uh, right. chord at the beginning and uh, we couldn't, we, we were yeah, interesting, yeah. and there is several objects so who need the acoustic. Also working with uh, Benoit on uh, incompressible, di dilatable code with uh, Professor Bevin, incompressible active. This one is the physics are is much more cooler than this one, but uh, for other applications we needed the acoustics, the flame acoustic interaction. That's why we also uh, developed this code. The applications are. Uh, for, for Eric was expanding flame because we wanted to test, uh, that would be the, my talk on Wednesday, uh, the ability of the, an evolution equation model well known to be compared with DNS and with homemade experiments because at Korea we also make experiments so we can interact, and it's not easy, with experimentalists, talk with experimentalists and have um, the feedback of, of their knowledge. Uh, I'm also working on mesoscale combustion with the uh, mesoscale combustion. Uh, we developed a small combustor of about uh, 640 square no, cubic millimeters. So it's a, a small object of the, the, the chamber is 8 by 8 by 10 millimeters. So we choose a cubic chamber, so we can have windows, quartz windows, and uh, inject laser beams, and see how the, the flame is inside. 
and also we can make compressible reactive simulations in order to see the acoustics and the, uh, the yeah, interaction between flame and acoustic in this very, very tiny chamber. What's the Mach number in your chamber and your simulation? Uh, it's approximately the same as uh, the simulations of Eric, maybe a little more. There is three, we have, I have three students here working at Norlita. I have Eric working on this code, Julien, uh, <laughs> Benoit working on uh, incompressible code, Julien is another student. And Marianne Schostrand, which is uh, half from Sweden, working on this. And when you're talking about reactive, uh, Excuse me? When you're talking about reactive, uh, what kind of chemistry you use? Alors, this one is very simple. Is uh, fuel plus oxygen gives products. One single step. Yeah. This is very it's simple. For of course, of course. I used to work on complex chemistry when I was younger. It's not the same difficult. So this is here we wanted only to have one should be extremely careful using uh, one step in one step chemistry of course what? extremely what is the object uh, what is the aim of this metal scale experiment <laughs> 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 sorry i'm coming in late but yes okay alors we're working with uh, intelligent people from milan yeah. <coughs> they also had the, I would say, the, the history because they used to work on metal conversion since several years now. Uh, the aim was to produce electric power locally. Okay. Yeah. So to have thermovoltaic power. Mm. But also, we, we are not, we are only working on combustion ourselves. But the other application would be the um, uh, micro thrust. We were most interested, we are more likely uh, interested in combustion problems than in all these applications. We are we're not able to do uh, thermovoltaic application ourselves. So we, we need to work with uh, other people. Uh, what else? We are, we are also working on uh, flame wall interaction, and there is another uh, project on uh, LES. That's why I'm here. LES modeling for internal combustion engines. And I, I got a, another student coming in the November working on that. And I um, mainly worked on DLS, in complex chemistry, a long time ago, on uh, supersonic combustion. But I'm not very familiar with the LES. Of course, I know the, the theory, but uh, the practice is different. So that's why I'm, uh, I came here. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. from Lindgren University of Israel. Uh, the key words of my activity is a uh, turbulent transport. A turbulent transport of particles, droplets, aerosols. And this part related to turbulent combustion. Also, turbine transport of magnetic fields. This part related to astrophysics and jet physics. Also, turbine transport of heat. This is turbine convection. This is mainly analytical studies, but also uh, we have a laboratory and we collaborate with experimental people. Participate yeah. in these experiments. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we use different approaches uh, in theoretical physics, like uh, quasi-linear approach, path integral approach, renormalization approach, and different tools of theoretical physics. But we will, uh, we have very long-term collaboration with Nagin Priori, and also with Axel Brandenburg. Yeah. So, uh, 
So, but this part is related to uh, turbine combustion, and it's very interesting to apply our knowledge in turbine combustion. We published several papers on turbine combustion, but I'm not a great ex expert in this field. Okay. And I persuaded uh, Sri Vasan to come and also uh, talk to us. He is, uh, has been giving talks at the previous part of the program, in connection with turbulent boundary layers. But of course, his talks are of much more broader relevance. And this morning, many of you were present as well, was giving a talk on passive scalar. But please, uh, could we also say if you were oh, about okay. uh, right. your, yeah. your work, possibly okay. that part that is related to the question? Um, um, not much, we also say. I uh, leave the rest of it here, no. <laughs> so I don't have to rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my name is uh, Srinivasan. People uh, call me Srini, so. <laughs> Nobody knows what we stand for. My passport says what they are. So I, I was at the um, uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics for the uh, last few years. And uh, I left the place and went to Grant Institute and, uh, and Physics Department in NYU. Uh, I'm still setting up myself up, uh, so, uh, but I can tell you what I have been doing in the last couple of years, by and large. Um, I would say I have been working on three problems. One has to do with uh, superfluidity and uh, superfluid um, quantized vortices and things of this sort, about which I gave uh, some part of it I gave in the program. That, uh, Axel mentioned earlier about vortex reconnections and things like that. The other is a passive scalar problem, which is what I spoke about this morning, mostly about uh, mixing of passive scalars, which uh, for combustion is an essential part, but not the only part. Um, the third problem in which I have been working on uh, a great deal is a turbulent convection. Um, especially at very high ready numbers. So by and large, I have spent my time last few years on these three problems, although I sometimes uh, work on other things. Um, and uh, I have some thoughts on uh, um, the kind of experiments one should set up for uh, advancing uh, turbulent convection to the next uh, level. Uh, now I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking um, that I might be uh, getting back, getting uh, to work in an area in which Axel has been working for many years. This is astrophysical uh, convection problems. So um, that's at the moment where I am. I'm still writing papers from last year, so I'm not uh, really doing very much uh, in the last few months. Three, four months I have only written papers, mm. not, uh, not done anything. No, yeah. equally important, of course. It's a backlog of stuff I'm not doing. I have not really done anything new, I would say, last uh, four or five months. No. Okay, yeah, thank you. My name is Nathan Krivoli. I am from Israel, from Ben Gurion University. Uh, <coughs> these two Hebrew names, a Jewish person, of course. In Hebrew, my name means vessel of light. It's really I just understood it 20 years ago that I immigrated to Israel. Name, after age eight. Ah, uh, well, eight, nine, no, uh, eight. <laughs> 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 it's a uh, interesting story. This name, uh, I've 
I got my PhD in Space and Solar Physics in Moscow, and the beginning of my supervisor was Akademisha Zeldovich, and he uh, how find this strange transcription with double E in his ideas, in order to keep his memory, he was really, who know, maybe, you know, of course, his, this person, he was a fantastic person, a real teacher, and I think him this strange transcription. But, uh, uh, so, I started my business in turbulence 32, I think, years ago, in, uh, in, in, in turbulence diamond. And in astrophysics, after that, and maybe my thesis was one of the first in nonlinear dynamo theory. Mostly it was midfield dynamo. Almost 20, 19 years ago, I immigrated to Israel, and I started work in turbulent transport of passive scholar. Before it was turbulent transport of uh, passive vector, or not, not passive. And uh, we were, and 10 years ago, we organized, as a transition I worked, of course, and 10 years ago we organized experimental laboratory in our department, and now I, I, can, I, I can say that 30% of my interest in this, uh, say, experiments, 30% uh, of my interest in turbulent transport of particles and uh, heating transport, and maybe 30% is in astrophysics. Uh, we find several interesting phenomena in our Are you in the physics department? Uh, no, unfortunately, or fortunately, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, engineering, a mechanical engineering department. Because in, in Israel, as in the US, unfortunately, turbulence is part of mechanical engineering. It's bad news because I think it's reduced level. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Uh, but of course, turbulence is a physical phenomenon, not uh, engineering. Not only engineering, physical. Okay, we find several interesting results in turbulent transport, which may be relevant to this uh, problem. First of all, turbulent thermal diffusion, and something similar to uh, turbulent uh, uh, um, uh, thermophoresis, but much more stronger in frequency of turbulence. We find posterization, all these theoretical results, and after that, we find this result in our laboratory. Uh, now in DNS. And now in DNS, because we have got very strong collaboration during more than half years, maybe a couple of years with Axel, and so we feel very happy to participate in this program. Yeah. In the turbulence uh, statistics, uh, people have not paid as much attention to clustering as they should, really. I think it's a very important aspect, but hardly do you see any mention of this or any discussion of in astrophysics, I think, is a little bit more enlightened than, than uh, formal turbulence uh, in this matter. Uh, although astrophysics is a more difficult problem and um, less easy to observe, uh, you know, in detail. But still, I think uh, so. Maybe if uh, your program focuses a bit on Problems like clustering would be quite interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah By the way, uh, uh, just now accepted our new paper mm -hmm. about this stuff. This both theoretical and experimental. We demonstrated that the presence of gradient of temperature, clusterization, much more stronger than without gradient of temperature. Mean, mean temperature. How do you characterize it statistically, uh, um, and what kind of properties you can uh, you can Define uh, the relation function. scaling. You the know, I mean, there are very interesting questions. The relation there. function, and we find this relation function yeah. in the experimental. Yeah. What's interesting? Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, I would add that Nathan and uh, Igor use a very powerful uh, analytical technique. Yeah, but not especially the, very good. complicated for beginners. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we know simple results, not only so <laughs> huge mess. No, it's just. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. yes, you can remove turbulent transport. It's <laughs> 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 uh, an Robert. I'm 
I'm originally from Canada, but I did my PhD in Switzerland, and now I work here at KTH Mechanics for the last few months. Um, to make a change, I'm an experimentalist, and uh, I don't do uh, turbulence that much. I'm here uh, partly because of uh, curiosity, and partly because uh, my previous work, I think, finds some application in turbulent combustion modeling. But I worked uh, on my most uh, uh, profound interest in combustion has to do with trying to make some simple experiments to see uh, complicated things in a controlled uh, environment. So um, my work for my PhD had to do with studying uh, thermal diffusive instabilities in unpremixed or, un or non-premixed flames. And uh, I built a research burner allowing the production of unstrained one-dimensional diffusion flames where uh, it was mainly uh, uh, done through collaboration with uh, Professor Macron at the uh, in, uh, University of Illinois. And uh, he, he has all these stability models for diffusion flame stability where he uses this kind of simplified construct where the oxidizer is in the stream at the top and the fuel is coming from the bottom and flame forms here. And in theory, the oxidizer counter diffuses against the flow, but in practice, it's not very possible to verify. So we did build something like that and we were able to see a little bit what we predicted theoretically and it was in good agreement. So I'm here uh, partly to uh, see how this fits in more complicated models that rely on the stability of one dimensional uh, flamelets to uh, understand more complicated configuration and hopefully I will learn a bit more about, about turbulent combustion in the process. And uh, I work at the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, formerly at the astronomy department, but since the astronomy department has been abolished <laughs> beginning of this year, we are now in the physics department. And uh, <coughs> previously I was a uh, postdoc here at Morita working with Voxel, and uh, I'm also future ex-assistant professor here. Uh, Since when did you be a future ex? Uh, <laughs> that has not been decided yet. <laughs> 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 be before the end of this year. So it's a leaf at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indefinite. <laughs> and uh, I'm, mostly, I'm mostly interested in uh, turbulence and dynamos stars like the sun, especially understanding uh, the large-scale magnetic fields that we see in the sun. And uh, furthermore, I'm interested in accretion disks and turbulence and angular momentum in accretion disks. And uh, I don't really know much about combustion, and the main reason I'm here is that I have some unfinished business with Igor and Nathan and Fox as well. So hopefully I will learn, <laughs> learn something about combustion as well. So, where do the magnetic field lines that you see on the surface of the sun, where, are, where do they originate? Which part of the sun do they originate mostly? You mean where the magnetic no, field is mostly generated? Yeah, you see? Yeah, that's, 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 no, that's, no, no, no. that's a very uh, controversial question. Part, right? So I'm asking you. Yeah, we are, I think all of the people in this room are probably believing that it's closer to the surface in the outer 40, me uh, outer 20 mega uh, outer 40 megameters, but the standard belief is that it's actually 200 megameters beneath the surface. So and you have to tell me that's in the terms of radius. Yes, the, the radius is 700 megameters, so it's okay. 30% inwards, and we are thinking it's more in the outer 5%. I see. So, if we speak about regular magnetic field, it's 0.3 from radius, and fine structure, sunspots, maybe not so big. Yes, that's important. You should yeah, talk yeah, to yeah. you about this yeah, yeah. the rest of this. Yeah. 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 So, 
Okay, my name is Tumaif Weidal. I work at uh, Sintef in Trondheim, so the three people from, from Trondheim. Um, my main um, uh, focus now is... Uh, and, uh, Sintef. So Sintef is a contract research uh, company in, uh, in, in Norway. Okay. Okay. About, uh, Seventeen hundred. That's enough. Norway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Norway was mentioned previously. Well. Okay. Um, so my main uh, focus now is, is on a uh, stochastic uh, turbulence model, turbulent uh, combustion model called the linear eddy model. This is a cooperation that uh, we have with Alan Kirstein at the uh, Sandia National Forest, and uh, also. Uh, uh, and Alan will be here for the last week, I think. And also Sigur Sannan at Sintef uh, is also working on the same, some same project. For so the last two weeks, no? Uh, uh, yes, for the last two weeks. Okay. Yeah. So, so the linear eddy model is is basically a one-dimensional uh, diffusion reaction uh, equation that you solve for the result, and and then you do some stochastic rearrangements to to emulate the uh, three-dimensional um, turbulence. So, but we have been building, uh, extending this uh, model, and we call it the LEM3D, and also to a uh, combustion application. And then we need some coupling because you don't have um, uh, velocities or momentum as a part of this model. We have some kind of coupling to <coughs> uh, currently uh, a RAMS. Uh, model to provide uh, the, the, the mean velocity field. So that's, and this is something I'm going to defend in less than a month. So uh, my PhD thesis. Okay. Questions? No. Less than a month means during this program. This means uh, first of June. So okay. Uh, yeah. So much. <laughs> so. <laughs> Pronounce it one more time slowly. <laughs> 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 but I don't expect that anybody pronounce it completely correct. <laughs> so I'm with you, sir. Um, I'm working uh, since 2001 at uh, KTS. And um, in fact, I'm not, or we're not doing so much on combustion yet. But in the past, I worked um, a lot on uh, Pascal and Maximum turbine flows. And in the recent years, um, I extended a bit and uh, doing a lot of uh, DNS. And we have um, several PZ projects working on LES modeling, and also Pascal to spot in uh, turbine flows. And recently, um, we want to do uh, DNS. So what we have simulated. Are you in the Netherlands before sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm from the Good for France Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now I recognize who you are. <laughs> um, at the moment, one PC student is uh, working on the simulation of the turbine ball yet. And we have uh, mainly looked at the uh, best scale and maximum in the turbines in the ball yet. But uh, recently we have also added a simple reaction with the isotherm. And we want to uh, extend to turbo combustion so that we with heat uh, effects. And, and the main uh, topic of interest is then just the interaction with the wall. And so we would like to uh, look at a situation that we have in a rather cold wall. What typically happen, can happen in uh, a combustion application. This is an experiment or No, DNS. Yeah. It is something we would uh, like to set up. And hopefully the PZ soon will uh, join the program. So so hopefully she can uh, interact with some of the people who are more experienced with uh, doing this kind of thing, with including the uh, reaction. We would like to keep the reaction quite simple. 
that the home in uh, Inter is just uh, look a bit more congestion. Is the injection local or distributed or is it uh, one place? Um, we would, um, in this case, we just have a fuel here and a simple oxidizer in the engine's uh, golf flow. Okay, I, I so thought this, the... So this is here and this is turned back here. I thought the arrow there is suggesting injection somehow. No, uh, yeah. heat is wrong. Yeah. 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 Any questions? Or? At the moment, yes, but we, we still have to uh, look at it. But in fact, um, I think the first step is to, to put in uh, some uh, thermal effects, and that's already uh, complex enough. I'm not sure if the flame will uh, get stable in, in this case. So uh, don't make it too complex at the first step. Yeah. As a comment, both to you and to you. <laughs> In this case, we have to compromise a bit, so you can't do everything at once. No, 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 sure, sure. But uh, in the long run, we will have to, to think about it. <laughs> Let me ask a question in this context. Uh, I understand that you, if your reaction, re reactions are enough complicated, the system enough complicated, you should be very careful. But if we use so-called uh, progressive chemical coordinate, is it so problem? No, it is some linear combination of, uh, of number density according to stereochemical uh, coefficients. So you can rewrite your equation as, as one in some sense. Okay. If you correct, if you've got correct uh, source of your chemical, uh, no. You it's what they call progress variable. It's named in, in literature, it's named uh, progress, progress yeah. chemical reaction. Okay, well, yeah, but uh, it doesn't uh, really help. Because why? Uh, should we go in detail um, about well, this? We, <laughs> we can discuss this. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Why can't you? Of course, it's not enough. Yeah. Well, there is one one thing that I can say that is quite simple. That when you when you do that, mm -hmm. when you parameterize, uh, you usually assume that the, the gradient of species and the gradient temperature is aligned. At the wall, they are not, because you have a, a, a heat mm -hmm. flux toward the wall, so a, a heat sink, and the, the species are not allowed, aligned any longer as they are in the parametrization that you do, as a, as a laminar plane. It depends how you do this parametrization. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I believe it's, uh, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. You have to okay. have a detailed chemistry. Well, yeah, there's uh, one thing I would like to mention, what I'm doing myself at the moment. It doesn't has to do anything with uh, combustion effects much. But at the moment I'm looking at uh, the nesting of uh, turbulent laminar patterns. So if you look at the plane close to the wall, what you can, ha can, have, uh, can happen in the jet flow and channel flow, is you get patterns of turbulence and then laminar patterns. So here is turbulence, and here lambda, and then again have this kind of bands. And that is something I'm looking at at the moment. And, and different kind of systems, or so, uh, flow with rotation, and channel flow with stratification. So my name is Cheson, uh, very difficult, but my last name is quite easy, uh, Bye. and I'm uh, 
originally from uh, China. And uh, in fact, I, I did my uh, PhD here in, uh, here in um, KTH in uh, 94. And then I moved to London University. I guess who uh, most of you uh, know Moon because of the combustion lab there. Yeah, we have a, a C cost and uh, KCFP. Uh, these are big labs or big centers. We have about uh, 100 researchers there working in the combustion area. Uh, mostly working uh, experimentally, they use different kind of uh, laser techniques to measure different things, uh, reaction structures, and the species, and so on. And then in the energy science department, we have uh, uh, our group of fluid mechanics group, in that group. We're doing uh, numerics, 100% numerics. We're using uh, mostly uh, larger dissimulation, trying to not so much to develop a uh, larger dissimulation method, but try to apply the method to uh, different uh, combustion devices, combustion process, like uh, uh, HCCI engine, which is uh, a very special engine. That, uh, it's an internal combustion engine, which runs pre-mixed and compressed ignition. So it's like a bomb, <laughs> but you burn very lean. So the pressure hopefully will not be too high. And then uh, we also use LES to, to work with the uh, uh, gas turbine type of applications. Uh, so I have a Swedish industry supporting this. And uh, currently, we're, our interest is to, uh, to understand uh, what is going on in SCCI, for example. Because SCCI, initially, they want to have a kind of a homogeneous ignition everywhere. So then you have a real control. But uh, we always have the homogeneity in the, in the engine, in the charge. So therefore, you develop uh, something, maybe Michael Littman will talk. Sometimes we have a definition time. They call it definition. Well, we have very sharp pressure uh, rate. Anyway, uh, it's inhomogeneous type of reaction from propagation. And we are we're trying to use LES to simulate those, but it turns out very difficult because uh, there's a missing link between how to model this chemistry into uh, this practical propagation pro process. Seems to me that we have to use uh, DAS. So we love to be here that uh, many of you have experience in DAS. So we try to use DAS, try to study uh, kind of homogeneous ignition with uh, temperature stratification. That, that's, uh, I hope that I can learn a lot from you. Yes. For HCCI, you need complex chemistry. Yeah. So what kind of complex chemistry do you need with DNS? Uh, as I said, we don't do DNS so Not much yet. yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, we have to really use kind of tabulation uh, with digital chemistry. Let's say whatever the digital chemistry we have. Uh, for, uh, we have been working a lot with the ethanol using Marinos mechanism. Uh, but uh, DNS, we, we are starting to do something as with the hydrogen, starting to simple with the detailed chemistry. Mm. I think that one of the most interesting ideas is HCCI agent. It is uh, control and stabilize uh, HCCI, it is uh, plasma assistant uh, combustion. It's very difficult to control HCCI. That, that, that is the so main no simple problem. That's, that's <laughs> problem. That is the main technical barrel, I would say, from it to be applied to the real engine. Yeah, but I know that it is already uh, in progress with the master. Yeah. So today there are a lot of uh, uh, directions uh, to promote the SCCI. One thing is to use some kind of inhomogeneity. In the, in the mixture, in fact, go away from HCCI, HCCI to 
some traditional uh, mix of uh, uh, things. Would you be prepared to uh, say more details about this uh, tomorrow during the discussion session at 10.30 on LES? Tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I can uh, mm -hmm. think about it. Okay. And um, who else? I know already Krista Fogel, uh, of course. No. Uh, uh, Lost of Fox will be also available tomorrow. Will be coming for the uh, LES discussion session at 10:30. Uh, anybody else who will uh, have, make some want to make some statements? You may want to have some uh, slides, like up to, uh, four slides or something. Or anybody else? Four to six slides to show to uh, get the discussion started. We'll see that by tomorrow then, and uh, I think we should have now a short break, and then we'll continue with. Should you say something about the conference at the end of the? Uh, yeah, uh, I should emphasize indeed, as you said, uh, we have a, a two-day conference, a two and a half-day conference at the end of this program. <laughs> Many of us will, of course, stay during the entire period, and that's clearly a time when uh, I wish everybody to, should give a, a regular talk. They will not be terribly long, but that's, of course, the time to give a regular talk if somebody is not scheduled so far or anything. But we will have uh, discussion sessions with informal short talks, and, of course, the conference at the end with uh, regular talks, hopefully by as many people as we have from the program. Plus, and any other questions? This is a month long conference. Yes. So we have a short break. In the meantime, we shall reserve So you can make yourself a copy here, for example. Stay here, for example. We see you. Yeah.